Hi all, uh, thanks for joining in. I'm Prabhas Srivadhan from WSO2. Uh, yeah, so this is a quick uh, overview of WSO2. If you hear about WSO2 for the first time, uh, we are a company which focuses on building uh, open source products. Uh, we have three main uh, products: identity uh, a server, uh, which is a, a product in the IAM domain, and that's the product uh, I've been leading for the last 13 years. Uh, we also have an API manager and an enterprise integrator. All the products are released under the most business-friendly Apache Tool license. Uh, company was founded in uh, 2005 and we have 600 plus employees uh, while our main R&D center is in Colombo, Sri Lanka and we have offices in New York, London, uh, Mountain New, uh, then Brazil, Sydney and uh, Berlin and I am based out of uh, the uh, Mountain New uh, US office. We have uh, around uh, 550 customers across all our products and identity server itself we have uh, around 200 class customers and uh, so these customers are global like uh, around 70 plus customer uh, in 70 plus countries uh, and we got 120 new customers in 2019 a quick overview about uh, the identity server uh, identity server is an open source iam product uh, which uh, focuses on uh, ciam and uh, we also plan to do a SaaS based offering, uh, our uh, cloud offering, uh, which will be launched in uh, June this year. So that's that's some news for some people. Uh, we, we already have a cloud, but uh, you will see like major improvements and a new cloud offering in, in June will come as a, a total a different uh, one what you see in the cloud today. It has better user experience uh, and uh, better developer experience. Uh, so you will see uh, what's new in June and if you join our slack channel like you can get access to uh, the early builds of the product as well In uh, identity server we focus on uh, these uh, areas. So mostly our strength is on a uh, web single sign-on and identity federation We do support all uh, prominent single sign-on and identity federation standards like open ID connect uh, SAML 2.0 uh, then CAS WS federation and also WS2 identity server can uh, act as an IT broker. So that means you may have a service provider which supports OpenID Connect and you can use identity server to connect that service provider to an IDP which supports SAML. Uh, and identity server will do uh, the trust brokering as well as uh, uh, transform the tokens between multiple heterogeneous protocols. Also, we support strong and adaptive authentication. So if you go to store.wsv.com, you can find there are like 40 plus connectors uh, which support uh, FIDO 2.0 with, with uh, passwordless authentication and also uh, for many other connectors like uh, RSS secure ID, uh, certificate based authentication, uh, uh, then TOTP, OTP or SMS and email and many other connectors you can find in our uh, connector store. Then we do support account management and ID provision. You can deploy ID in the server or any uh, users store. It can be an LDAP, Active Directory, or even a database. And then you can do uh, very like core IND management operations uh, on, on your user base. And also we do support IND provisioning with uh, Scheme 2 And also uh, uh, we have custom connectors for Salesforce and uh, Google Labs. Fine grain access control is supported with SACML. Uh, also, uh, we are going to add support for OPA, Open Policy Agent. It's a prominent open source project uh, uh, in, in most in the uh, cloud native applications. Then API security, we support all the uh, core specifications around O2O and IMT analytics. Uh, we have our own analytics product, which identity server connects to. And also we are building uh, connectors to other analytic product, analytics products like Splunk. As I mentioned before, we have around 200 production customers just for the identity server. And also apart from that, there are 500 plus universities using identity server through one of our partners. And uh, from uh, the accounts we know, uh, the identity server manages more than 100 million identities globally. Uh, we have a Slack channel open, so you can join Slack channel. We'll share uh, the invitation to join Slack channel when we share the slides with you. In Slack channel, we have around 330 members uh, at the moment and it, it keeps on growing. We also started IEM for Dev community globally. We have that in seven countries. 
at the moment we have around uh, 2000 plus members so if you go to our meetup site you can find links to uh, the respective uh, IEM community meetups yeah so uh, this is how uh, the Kapinche call recognized us in Q3 uh, 2019 so we were identified as a leader in Kapinche call leadership compass for identity APIs platform and also uh, Q4 2018, uh, we were identified as a leader in uh, access management and federation, and also a leader in uh, CIA in Q4 2018. Then Gartner listed us under honorable mentions in their magic content for access management in Q3 2019. And if you look at uh, the peer, Gartner Peer Insights, you can see identity server is uh, listed there uh, as number 10. Uh, if you look at the last 12 months rating. So if you are using Identity Server already, so please uh, go and rate us uh, on uh, on Gartner. So that will help other other uh, community and other customers to know about us. So if you share your experience there. Yeah, uh, so the major goal of CIM is to drive uh, the revenue growth by leveraging identity data to acquire and uh, retain customers. It will build an identity-centric ecosystem to nurture an, an anonymous website visitor into a well-known loyal customer. We have come across multiple uh, phases in the past, and today, at the age of customer, identity has become the glue for all contextual marketing. In uh, doing that, uh, in our journey towards CIM, we face multiple challenges. It all starts uh, with an anonymous user where we do not have any clue about, but wants to consume our services or at least uh, interested in our services. This uh, particular user a person may visit our website and will start exploring uh, the options there. Then uh, we may use marketing automation tools to capture all the interactions and store those data under marketing data sources. Also, uh, we should be able to correlate uh, this data to the user probably following some uh, session identifier. The next phase is uh, uh, this person uh, would download a white paper or probably uh, register for a webinar. Then uh, we get to know more about this user. And that data will probably go into a CRM system. Then after some time, our sales team uh, will talk to this guy and sell some products, say, for example, an insurance policy. This transaction data, including uh, some uh, customer information, will go into another CRM system. Now, uh, the, the one who bought the insurance policy later will log into a customer portal to do monthly payments. Before uh, logging, uh, he has to register and uh, for sign up, would need to share his personal data as well as some uh, data related to the previous transaction like uh, the insurance policy ID. Then the IEM system uh, will uh, talk to the corresponding CRM system to verify the data user entered and if all looking good, will create an account for the customer in the IEM system. This is uh, the, the typical workflow many follow to onboard a customer or uh, this is how we could start with an anonymous website visitor then nurture this anonymous website visitor uh, to a lead and uh, to a qualified lead and uh, finally to a customer there can be multiple variations uh, of this flow and uh, uh, we could be using multiple channels to onboard customers so uh, when you have multiple channels or multiple uh, points of connections that lead, leads into another problem we'll end up having siloed data sources and those siloed data sources may not know how to talk to each other. Uh, some of stats, uh, like 52% of uh, marketing leaders responsible for data and analytics believe data integration and uh, data management are the most time consuming activities. And also, over one third of marketers say their inability to integrate data uh, is the biggest obstruction to success of their analytics teams. This is a real challenge and uh, we need to find a solution. Then uh, protecting uh, customer data at large scale. 
unlike in a workforce IEM system, in a typical CIM system, uh, we work with millions of users. So we need to worry about how we securely store the PII data of these users and preserve privacy. This is another challenge uh, 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 we need to worry about when we are building a CIM solution. Okay, so when you build a CIM solution to address these challenges, these are some of the functional requirements we need to worry about. Under registration, yeah, under registration, uh, we we uh, do self-registration and or, or else uh, we can do registration over different other channels. So probably you, uh, a customer calls uh, your head uh, officer, administrator, and then uh, do a call center facilitated registration, uh, or else a customer could visit some kiosk and do self-registration. And even when we do self-registration, we need to see uh, how we do that either the, the user himself can enter a minimal set of data from scratch, or else we can connect to a social IDP to facilitate social registration. Uh, one key thing is when we do registration, we should only capture the minimal set of data we need. Then after that, as we learn more about the user, when the user or the customer starts interacting with our system, then we can do progressive profiling and capture more data about the user. So in our IEM system, we need to have endpoints. Uh, so the external systems, external applications, when they learn more about the user, the, the, the applications can push those data to the progressive profiling endpoint in our IEM system. Then single sign-on and provisioning, of a, a very key uh, component in any CIM system, uh, so you need to worry about building a single sign-on experience. If you have multiple uh, login portals, you should only be able to look, uh, like enter the credentials once. And also, uh, you need to uh, uh, integrate with social uh, IDPs for login. You should support bring your own identity concept. So if I have an account with Facebook, I should be able to log into the third-party system with uh, log into your uh, IDP with uh, my. Uh, Facebook account. Once again, uh, doing those stuff, you need to be careful as well. Uh, rather than just relying on one social IDP, you should rely. You should like have options uh, with multiple uh, IDPs. And also, even though like they can bring in uh, information, uh, data from external IDPs, you should also have an like uh, local login option as well. Always try to a bridge external uh, login with a local account. Otherwise, like if there's a like ban for a given social IDP, then your like total business will go down if people cannot log in to your system with that social IDP. So that in fact happened in, in many countries, including uh, in Sri Lanka once. Then uh, the strong adaptive authentication. Uh, so that's a key requirement. We see a lot of people now worry about uh, uh, the security and how, how they want to authenticate your system. Uh, what data shows is that if you just have a second factor, then that could reduce uh, the account compromise by 99.9%, right? So that's a, that's a big number. So at least you need to uh, have second factor authentication maybe over uh, SMS or OTP. So SMS OTP is the most popular option. So there are like uh, multiple debates that are like how, how secure SMS OTP is, but uh, Having SMS OTP is very much better than uh, not having any second factor uh, option. Uh, and the other option we see uh, becoming popular is TOTP. Uh, TO, like if you're using a Google Authenticator app, so that's using the TOTP protocol. If you want to go for a more uh, advanced option, then probably you can uh, use uh, FIDO2 with uh, web authentication. It's strong uh, uh, MFA option, but still at the mass market, it's not popular. Like Facebook, Google, all of them have FIDO2 enabled, but uh, I don't think many will. Many still using uh, FIDO. Many still using uh, either the TOTP application or else uh, SMS OTP. Then consent and privacy management. This is another uh, key key feature. How you how you uh, store your attributes and how you share your attributes. So whenever you store attributes, uh, you need to get the consent from the user. Just uh, like uh, store and process the attributes, and also. Uh, you need to get the consent on how you are going to use this particular user's attributes. 
then marketing capabilities so we'll discuss this uh, later on in detail so your system should be able to integrate with uh, crm systems like uh, uh, salesforce uh, sugar crm and also with other uh, marketing analytics tool like uh, salesforce pardot then marketo uh, like those software in addition to those functional requirements we also need to worry about non-functional requirements so these are the key uh, non-functional requirements we have seen but not just limited to these uh, five scalability is one one key requirement in any cim solution unlike in a workforce IM system we see uh, the the load the peak there's a big difference between the peak load and the average load in a cim system uh, because of that, like just having uh, having the hardware and the system provision to address the peak load will waste a lot of your resources. In that case, just having the scalability of the system is not enough. Your CIM system should support auto scaling. Right? So based on the demand, your system should be able to scale up and down. Then security, of course, it's given. Uh, if you handle any any customer data, your uh, system should be secure enough to do that usability is another key aspect uh, you need to worry about uh, the end users the customers and also there are another set of users who are using the uh, using your cim internally so that could be like cxos and also help desk administrators and other post personas who are using uh, uh, cim internally within your company then the extensibility what we have seen in cim is it's rather a product uh, it has it has become a solution that you build integrating multiple products uh, so we have seen some misconception that some vendors just selling uh, cim as a product so uh, if you are familiar with esb so that is what happened 10 years back so when esb and service oriented architecture was popular some vendors started selling uh, esb as sova right so if you want to have sova this is what you need to do you just deploy an esb that's not right right so SOA is a pattern. Uh, of course, ESB will help you to build that pattern, but it's not just about ESB. It's how you build your architecture to support SOA concept. So you may need to use other multiple products like as well. Like so you need to have an API manager, you need to have a message broker, and how you uh, build your services. Everything is part of how you build this SOA architecture. The same applies to CIA. So CIM is not just a product, it's a solution that you build uh you need to you you cannot do that with just a one product you need to have an integrated solution with an esb uh, then uh, uh, maybe you have an api management then you have an int management and then you will have a set of apis and all these apis should be securely integrated and then you need to worry about uh, reliable delivery and then these systems will integrate with other like marketing uh, crm and uh, analytics uh, for detection systems to build a complete CIM solution. To address that, your uh, uh, CIM solution should be extensible. You should be able to extend the product as and when you need. Another thing we have seen is when you talk to a customer, uh, uh, we, we see a lot of like unique requirements across the customers. At the same time, at the same time, they have some uh, uh, common things as well. So when you build the product, what we have done is we have uh, we have addressed the common use cases. So you can uh, with out of the box like if you just get that in server it, it addresses most of the common use cases but at the same time you made the product extensible so the customers can use that in server and extend it to address their own unique requirements as well so that's why extensibility is a key feature and then developer focus it also becoming popular it's very much related to extensibility so if you are to extend the product to address your use cases then it has to be developer focus as well what we have seen is most of the CIM projects at large scale, uh, either like uh, the customer themselves, they, they have a development team which will work with the identity server and other products to build the CIM solution, or else they will go with a, a system integrator to build the, uh, this integrated CIM solution. In either way, since there are developers involved, if the product is more developer focused, then you uh, vast reduce the time to market. So these are some of the non-functional requirements uh, you should look into if you are evaluating any CIM product. Okay, so we did a webinar a couple of weeks, weeks back. Uh, Ishara did that on uh, five pillars of CIM. 
So this is basically uh, what you see behind the iceberg. So the tip of the iceberg is uh, the consumer experience, uh, how you how you uh, build the experience for your customers and also other personal UI using the CIM system. But to build that consumer experience, you need to worry about these five things: APIs and integration, and scalability, how you build, uh, facilitate strong adaptive authentication, analytics, and then security and privacy. So I won't go into details because we had a like, dedicated webinar uh, on this. Now let's focus on maturity model. So we've spoken to many customers. If you look at the identity server customer base, I would say uh, more than 90% of our customers, they are using identity server uh, to build CIM solutions and most of them are in fact uh, internet facing. So talking to them, what we have seen is different uh, customers, they are at different levels. Not all of them are in the same level and some in fact, they don't know they are using CIM, right? So they are they are building customer facing applications without even knowing that they are worrying, uh, they are building a CIM solution. So let's go through some of these levels and understand uh, like uh, what are the uh, features and what are areas that you worry about in each of these levels. By the way, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to raise that on uh, uh, the go to webinar chat. So there's a question: uh, Will the slides be made available? Yes. So both the slides and the recording uh, will share with you uh, after the webinar. So this is level zero. In this level, uh, uh, basically you don't track any customer interactions. Probably you don't have any online portal, and probably you don't do any online sales. You, you may have online portal just to display like your contact information like email, uh, then maybe phone number. So you would expect, uh, uh, accept orders through a phone call or Viber or WhatsApp or other means, but uh, still you won't track the user. So there's no login system, no IT management system, no CRM system in place. Uh, for example, uh, so many restaurants doing uh, this today, right? So when you walk into a restaurant, there's no login, nothing like that. So uh, the waiter will come to you, then you need to find a table, then they will bring the menu to you. So every time you visit the restaurant, you need to share your preference with them. There's no tracking or no recording. So there can be cases like if, if you visit the re same restaurant again and again, then there's a possibility the waiter there uh, would know you, would, would remember your uh, preferences. So that once again, very much uh, driven by uh, the human memory, right? So it has a dependency on how much these waiters can remember. So that's the level we see there's no CIM system in Nexus, right? So we see a lot of like uh, restaurants, taxi services, even for example, right? Not like Uber or Lyft. When you take a taxi, every time you need to share uh, your address, right? So you can't just say, take me home. So you need to share your preferences all the time and, and there's no way to track the returning visitors. And many family businesses today, they are also at the level zero. Then uh, level one, so we call this logged in. Uh, so at the logged in level, you only worry about uh, getting users logged into your system. Right? So once again, under level one phase, you will see many companies at different stages. Right? So not all of them are like doing everything listed on this slide. Uh, the very initial step would be you put online uh, 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 registration page so people can register and then uh, log into the system and then they can place orders. Right? Uh, so this is a very good uh, step forward from level zero. And also doing that, uh, uh, you can uh, you can improve the level one within itself. Uh, so you register user, then probably you can integrate the social account with the local account and facilitate login through uh, social accounts. And moving forward, you can implement MFA adaptive authentication options, and some may uh, uh, build a help desk and then uh, delegate administration around uh, your portals. But still, there will be no CRM system in place. You don't track the customer preference or uh, other stuff. Uh, so it's purely an identity management you are building in, in sub phases under the login phase. You only worry about the customer identity. You don't uh, you don't capture their preferences or you don't uh, uh, integrate uh, your CRM, uh, the, uh, your identity management system with external systems like CRM or marketing or anything, right? And also you won't you won't track uh, the user's behavior pattern like how many times a user visits a website and leads anonymous users. Nothing will be tracked. Just just maintaining identity for your users. 
and another thing we have seen is even people at this stage in, in larger companies when you have multiple uh, departments uh, and each department could interact with other their customers in different ways so they will still maintain their own portals and then disaggregated user stores right so that means still uh, uh, still the companies in this phase they won't build a unique uh, single sign experience for all their users right? so you can within this phase itself you can move forward by improving how you do uh, uh, IT management then uh, level two this is another step forward from uh, the level one uh, the logged in phase here in addition to the identity management system you will have a crm a marketing automation then consent and preference management systems in place but all disconnected right uh, so this is the phase we see uh, many companies will start to worry about a crm system in uh, phase one or level one level zero and level uh, uh, one they won't even worry about a crm system they, they don't even know they are doing CIM. But when you get to uh, level two, you start realizing the deficiencies in the system. Then you will try to integrate the system, uh, like all the systems in your solution, and try to break these silos. So this is the point where you worry about or start uh, researching about a CIM system, right? So here, even though you have CRM, marketing automation, those systems, they are disconnected. Uh, you cannot track a user across all these systems. So you won't be able to say uh, how long it, it took to nurture a lead uh, uh, to, a, a, to a, lo a loyal customer, or else you cannot say how, how much time it took to nurture an anonymous, uh, anonymous lead to a qualified lead, then to a customer. So those information are not there. You cannot correlate the user attributes that you store across different data sources. And also, if you are uh, like CEO or someone at the top asks you to generate a report uh, to find this data, then you have to go through like a high labor intensive process to uh, look in these different data sources and build a report. Right? It's a very time consuming, hard process. Then level three is a connected phase. So where uh, you start connecting all your systems together. You connect your identity management system uh, to your CRM, marketing automation, consent and preference management system. Then you can build a unified view of your customer. And we see progressive profiling is also coming to this phase. So, so you may have your CMS system and then uh, other, other, uh, other uh, applications. Then when those applications start learning about uh, the customer, those applications can push those data to your IEM system. Then IEM system can build a, a unified profile for a given customer, aggregating all this data together. Right. And another thing is, uh, uh, so just just having an isolated uh, uh, marketing automation software, then you can track uh, users uh, just using cookies, right? Uh, anonymous users using cookies but it's hard to track users across platforms but when you correlate these anonymous cookies uh, to a user's identity then you can uh, you can uh, uh, track the user's behaviors across multiple devices as well because the, that cookie is linked to a uh, user identity then also these uh, uh, other systems can feed the uh, idea iem system with behavioral patterns then uh, IEM system can do better informed uh, adaptive and press based authentication uh, and fraud detection. And also you can uh, like build better visualization uh, uh, and present data in a more meaningful manner. Right? So this is the connected phase. We see uh, like uh, with respect to level two, we see only a minimal set of uh, minimal set of uh, customers in this uh, level three phase. So build to build a level three phase, just having an idea IEM solution is not enough. You need to have uh, like API management. You need to have uh, uh, enterprise integration, uh, other stuff too, because this is more uh, more like an integration project rather than just an IDM uh, identity management project. Then finally, uh, the level four, or we call it optimized. So here you will see uh, omnichannel access. Uh, so in, in an omnichannel environment, 
uh, the customers interact with uh, the business via multiple channels, but uh, will still get a seamless, continuous user experience. For example, if you use a Newsweek iPhone app to highlight some content, once you view the same uh, from the web, you should uh, find it still highlighted. Amazon, in fact, took uh, the retail ordering uh, order placing system to the next level uh, with Alexa. Also, an Amazon customer can place an order via its website, uh, mobile app, or via Kindle, in addition to Alexa using multiple channels. Uh, when Amazon announced uh, Amazon Books a few years back, their intention was to bring the same digital experience to the real world. So, if you visit an Amazon bookstore, you will realize. Uh, uh, so they have book reviews, ratings, and many other digital world only features in Amazon Books. Then uh, another example is Amazon Go. So uh, at Amazon Go, it uses sensors to track items uh, as we put them into the cart or return them in the shelf. And finally, uh, your Amazon accounts get automatically charged with no uh, cashier involved. So this is in fact the next level of omnichannel experience Amazon is building. Then uh, the CXO dashboard. So you should be able to have readily available CXO dashboard, which will focus on, or uh, you should be able to derive insights with uh, respect to, to the, the growth of the customers or leads over time. So there should be a way to find out how much it, how much time it took to nurture an anonymous uh, uh, website visitor to a lead, then from a lead to a, a, a qualified lead, then from qualified lead to a customer. And also you should be able to like break down this data uh, by by geography and based on customer attributes and other stuff. And also at this phase, uh, at the op optimized level, people will start using machine learning to predict uh, customer behavior. So based on that, uh, they will identify customer preferences and based on that, they can decide the direction of their business. So this is the optimized level. We don't see many customers at this level, so very few. Uh, and once again, at this level, it's not just an identity management product. It's to, it's it's a like total integration project as well. Yeah, so that's what uh, we plan to cover in this webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we can take them now. Yeah. Uh, so there's a question about slides. Yeah. So we'll share the slides and the recordings with you. And. Uh, do the there's another question do these mature levels apply to uh, governments too yes i think these mature levels will apply uh, to uh, all the verticals uh, will be applicable across all the verticals and in fact we see a lot of interest these days like uh, people are moving uh, from uh, level one uh, to level three right so many people we see today are at level one or level two but we see now there's a general interest to move ahead. And that's why uh, the role of system integrators uh, becoming more prominent because now uh, customers, they don't just deploy isolated IEM product, but they want to build an integrated solution. Yeah, I guess uh, there are no more questions. Uh, so then thank you very much for joining. And we'll, okay, so that's another question. We'll take it quickly. Uh, we talked about authentication. Uh, but what about access? Yes. So basically, uh, so I uh, uh, identity management system will take care of both uh, authentication and access control. So you should be able to define your authentication rules, uh, access control rules in IDM. Uh, then you will have the policy enforcement points, especially the APIs, right? So API gateways will act as policy enforcement point to uh, enforce these access control rules. So it's another another like key area in any integration project. Is that to be centralized? Yeah. So once again, that's uh, up to the the architecture that you uh, follow, right? It necessarily need not to be uh, centralized. Even uh, even if you follow the API gateway pattern, so API gateway pattern itself is not a centralized pattern. You can have an API gateway, and at the API gateway level, you can do uh, like a post screen access control. Then, uh, uh, if you are using a, like microservice based deployment, then probably you have you will have micro gateway so based on different class domains so at, at uh, the micro gateway level once again you can have an enforce another set of access control policies and then uh, at the micro service itself you will have a proxy and uh, very service specific policies can be uh, applicable there 
and uh, uh, still like you can have centralized place to define your policies but that's also not necessary if you want to decentralize it of course you can do that and from that particular policy decision point you can push the policies to the corresponding uh, peps there's a question uh, what new ci opportunities you see when various governments uh, begin reopening yes i think uh, that's a very very good question uh, so we see with the uh, this covid 19 a lot of things uh, have changed a lot of people like the way we do things have changed a lot and many companies will uh, uh, worry about the opening up their like api services to be accessed remotely uh, so remote working will be very prominent i think yesterday twitter announced that uh, the employees could work from home uh, like uh, till when they were whenever they want uh, without any any time limit so opening up the apis opening up the system so the uh, outside their domain will be prominent not just for governments uh, but for uh, even in the for the the private sector at the time at now what we see is uh, there are many companies they haven't built their systems to be accessed outside their domain so they totally rely on vpn to do that so we see like uh, uh, like uh, vpn uh, uh, access has like uh, uh, gone up increased uh, uh, in a very high percentage in last couple of months but vpn itself doesn't give you like a, a complete secret solution you need to worry about iem too so we will see a lot of like iem say opportunities will come up when people uh, worrying about providing remote access to their employees and mfa is once again a critical uh, thing there yeah will wso to update its pricing to reflect uh, the maturity model uh so that i don't think i can answer now so there's some uh, effort going on uh, probably will uh, will keep you uh, informed so in terms of packaging so there's no uh, uh no change so we are we are uh, we are keep on supporting our open source product uh, so we'll uh, we'll have it uh, in the same way we do now you can just download it from uh, our website and use it and deploy it on prem but we'll also have a, a cloud-based solution that we uh, launched in june july time frame this year uh, yes so in, in terms of functional device you will see the same set of functions that you see in on-prem version in our cloud but it will be a more integrated solution like uh, for example you may have uh, a salesforce connector in your on-prem version but you will have more integrated solution with ci uh, with uh, salesforce in your cloud Another question: Profile management should be done in CIM or uh, externalized uh, through uh, a view in app. Yeah, so it can be done in both ways. So uh, we most of the time, what we see is people build their own own uh, portals and then uh, use consume uh, the APIs from the CIM system. But once again, it's based on your need. But if you uh, so there are CIM solutions that support uh, profile management out of the box with their own UIs. Uh, but in most of the cases, we see customers just rely on the APS. But once again, another key aspect of CIM uh, solution is even though you provide UI, so that has to be like uh, people should be able to extend the UIs, retain the UIs uh, with, with minimal effort. So I'm just checking whether I missed any questions. Yeah, I think that's all we have for now. Uh, so if you have any more questions, please uh, feel free to uh, send to me. Uh, my email address is prabhat at wc.com. Uh, thank you very much for joining and we'll share the recording with you and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Bye.